the next one is self-esteem. And self-esteem basically just has to do with you knowing that you're a good person. You know you're a good person, you know you're a talented person, you know you're a worthy person. There aren't a lot of other people you would rather be than you. That is self-esteem. That is good, healthy self-esteem. And that is a predictor of happiness in many areas of life, including in your romantic relationships. So if you have good, healthy, high self-esteem, then again, you know you're a good person, so you completely understand and accept that other people will love you and will find you desirable and will also think you're a good person. The person with low self-esteem, though, may be constantly doubting or questioning another person's motives. You know, if they really knew me, then they wouldn't really like me. If they find that out about me, then they're going to leave me and so on. And so this leads to, in some cases, less honesty in a relationship, which tends to create another set of problems. And so here, this comic strip, you can see it's Mr. Low Self-Esteem, and he's writing, Dear Diary, so sorry to bother you again. And that really captures someone with low self-esteem. And so life is harder for a person who has lower self-esteem. And it's also hard for the person dating the person with lower self-esteem. Because if you have good, health, good healthy self-esteem, then you can build yourself up from within. But if you don't, you constantly need other people to reassure you and to validate you. And so if you get in a fight with that person who's constantly validating you, then it can be very, very devastating and it can be very hurtful, which again can lead to conflict and other issues within the relationship. So in general, people with higher self-esteem are more honest, they're more likely to admit their mistakes, and they're more likely to bounce back and to realize if someone doesn't like me, it's not necessarily because I'm a bad person, but maybe we're just incompatible, or maybe they have an issue, and it's not me. Someone with lower self-esteem is more likely to internalize a failure situation, a rejection situation, and say, if I were a better person, this wouldn't have happened, and so on. So if you do feel like you sometimes question your worthiness and your value, then I would encourage you to think about that. And why do you think that? Why, where did those ideas come from? And you might want to consider going to our counseling center where they are well equipped to talk about these kinds of issues. And so they can help you see you as you really are and increase your level of self-esteem. The next one is communication. And communication just has to do with openness. It has to do with sharing. It has to do with self-disclosure, with listening and relating to one another. In this comic, the woman says, well, I'm all for the government's eavesdropping program. Nice to know somebody is listening to me. And they clearly have a communication problem. But if you're in a relationship, then you should be able to communicate about anything about a wide range of topics. There should be depth and breadth within the conversations that you have. You shouldn't be embarrassed or you shouldn't be self-conscious to talk about any, any issue if you're truly in a good, healthy relationship. Basically, you shouldn't be afraid for someone to know you exactly as you are. And I know that with college, it's all very busy and there's so much stuff going on, but to make your relationship work, you really always wanna allow time for you guys to just talk to one another so you're always aware of what's going on in each other's lives so you don't feel like one day hmm this person really doesn't matter they hardly know me at all so make sure that you protect time with the person with whom you have a relationship so you're always able to communicate so communication is important but it's particularly important how you communicate so I'm going to talk briefly about conflict and every relationship has conflict. It is truly a red flag to me if a couple says, we never fight. I think, hmm, I don't think someone's being honest here. Either you're not being honest about not fighting or you're not being honest with one another because no two people are completely compatible. So there's always going to be an issue. And fighting is not a predictor of happiness in a relationship. Anger is not a predictor of happiness in a relationship. It's all about how you fight. It has to do with how you communicate. So we're going to talk about what's called negative affect and these are predictors of great dissatisfaction and unhappiness in a relationship. In fact, this is used to predict how likely it is a couple will break up. So you can just ask yourself when we go through this list, does this sound familiar? Does this sound like you? Are these things that you do? Are these things that your partner does or a former partner did? Then that might explain why there are some issues or some there might be some tension in your relationship. But now that you're aware of them, then hopefully you can work on not doing these very tempting things that are very common 
in the future for the sake of your relationship it's worth it the first one is criticism when we want to criticize our partner we should do it in a way that looks only at the behavior they are doing that we don't like what our tendency is though is to criticize their personality so for example instead of saying you know it it, it, it hurts my feelings when you're always late all the time. It makes me you know, feel like you're not very respectful of my time. Instead, we say, you are the most inconsiderate person I have ever met. Now, being the most inconsiderate person, the person, the most inconsiderate person that person has ever met, I mean, that's pretty hard to change. But if you just say, I would appreciate it if you would be on time, now that's pretty easy to change. But again, we tend not to say the specific behavior that bothers us, but rather we just say, you are so lazy, you never do anything in our relationship. Instead of saying, you know, I think it would be great if you would plan what we do this weekend instead of me planning it this time. Very different. You'll get a very, very different response. So try to keep that in mind. And I know it's really hard, especially when you're in the emotional um, parts of a, a, of, a, of a conflict or an argument, but maybe that's when you should say mm, let's talk about it later and then you can just think about the specific behavior that you want them to change instead of this global character assassination that is much more likely to occur number two is defensiveness when we are criticized especially in a global way we tend to defend ourselves, and this often leads to what's called cross complaining which is when your partner says you know i don't like the way you never put the dishes in the sink instead of being mature and saying, okay, I'll work on that. You're right, I don't always put the dishes in the sink. Rather, we become defensive, especially people with lower self-esteem, and we fire back our own complaint. So and when you say, I don't like the way you always leave the dishes in the sink, I say, oh yeah? Well, I don't like the way you always leave your clothes in the floor. And so now I have attacked that person, and probably nothing is gonna be resolved. We're not focusing on what we need to focus on. So try to keep your arguments very focused and very specific on those specific behaviors and not become defensive. The third one is contempt, and this has a lot to do with how we speak to the person. Rolling our eyes is a very, very bad thing to do, but it's something the majority of people do. It's being very sarcastic in our responses. Uh, some of the people who do this research say contempt is the most corrosive, it is the most damaging thing that you can do in a relationship. And again, if you feel like this conversation is spiraling out of control with a lot of sarcasm and mocking, then just walk away, say let's talk about it tomorrow, and give both of y'all some time to cool off so it doesn't get worse and more damaging. And then the last one is stonewalling or withdraw. And stonewalling or withdraw is when one person they just shut down, they just stop talking, they refuse to discuss it anymore. They may physically leave and not come back or not say when they're coming back, or they may just not engage, so there's just nothing going on. And this is of the four, this is the one that often shows up last in the fights over time, but when this one comes, it's often signaling the end of the relationship because one of those people, it's not even worth it to them to try anymore. They've just given up. They're not going to fight for the relationship anymore. They have nothing left to say. So again, you can think about those four. Do you do any of those? And then maybe try to work on those. Then the last one on our list, this I'm just calling warning signs of abusive relationships. And everybody knows what physical abuse is. That's pretty clear. That's pretty obvious. There's not a lot of gray there. And the majority of couples don't experience physically abusive relationships, particularly in the beginning of a relationship. Often physical abuse doesn't show up until, um, for a heterosexual couple, until the couple is actually married. And then there are a whole another set of issues that are involved at that point. So it's easy to say, if someone laid a hand on me once, I'd be out the door. I would never let them harm me. But the problem is that emotional or psychological abuse can be just as damaging, if not more damaging, and it often precedes physical abuse. And a lot of times people who are abusive or manipulative, then they'll say, but I love you. I'm just doing it because I love you. And I'm going to read a list and you can just say, do you think this sounds like love? And what you can do is think about some relationship that you're in or that you've been in or you can imagine yourself being in and just keep a mental tally in your head of do you think these things are true or not? I feel my partner tries to run my life. I feel like my opinions or emotions don't matter. My partner cuts me down and calls me names. I find myself asking my partner's permission to spend time alone with friends or engage in activities that don't include him or her. 
I'm often accused of flirting when I talk to friends of the other gender. My partner's suspicious and jealous. I try to please my partner only to be criticized. When we argue, my partner always has to win and doesn't really listen to me. I am afraid of my partner. I feel nervous or afraid to refuse my partner's sexual advances. I have been threatened by my partner with a breakup, with physical harm, with suicide, etc. My partner has destroyed or stolen my property to punish me. And then finally, my partner has hit, kicked, or otherwise struck me during an argument. So you can see from that list of 12 items that only one has to do with physical abuse. But all of the others are also forms of abuse, and that's the emotional or psychological abuse. And the researchers who came up with this checklist say that if you answered yes to more than one of those, then it could indicate that there's something unhealthy going on in your relationship. So again, I would just encourage you to think about that list, and if you think that some of those do speak and describe your relationship, then you just wanna really think about your relationship and what the benefits are of that relationship, and it, just as important, maybe some of the sacrifices or the costs that are involved in that relationship. And, and if you want an expert to help you figure this out, then again, I encourage you to go to our counseling center and they can help you. So that's the end of our list of predictors of healthy, happy, stable, supportive relationships, what to look for and then what to avoid. And because we just talked about something rather negative, I don't wanna end on a negative note, so I just wanna remind you of the slide that we looked at towards the beginning where we listed all the benefits. So here they are again. You have better health, you live longer, less depression and loneliness less alcoholism, drug abuse, eating disorders, and even some psychological disorders. The prevalence of those things are lower if you have a good, healthy, stable, supportive relationship. And remember, like we said with friendships, the quality of your relationship matters for far more than the quantity. You really only need one person in your life that you can turn to in order to get many of these benefits. So my last comment is, as always, I wish you good luck during your time here at Georgetown and beyond.